Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Rapids Parish in Louisiana, late one night when I was around 11 or 12 years old, I was awakened by something at the window of my bedroom. As I woke up and looked around my room, the light from the street light in the backyard cast a shadow on my window. This shadow filled the entire eight-foot window, and it was the shadow of something walking by. The outline looked like a big person with a head leaning forward and messy hair. At the time, I thought, who is in my yard? As we had six acres of woods that backed up to Rogley Swamp and Flagon was nearby, so... I got up and went to the back door and stepped out to see who was out there. What I saw was something big and black that stepped over the four and a half foot chain link fence and walked into the woods. I did not know what I was looking at, but we lived rurally and our house was set about an acre off the road. I could not imagine it being a person. When I told my dad about it, he told me it was nothing and not to worry about it. So for years, I put it out of my mind. To this day, I'm not sure what I saw. All I know is it filled up the eight-foot window and stepped over a four-and-a-half-foot chain-link fence. In my mind today, that has got to be pretty big to do that. It was sometime in the middle of the night in rural woods and creeks, and Rogali and Flagon Swamps are nearby. Hardwood trees mainly. I remember my dad telling a story of deer hunting and seeing something large in a tree. He was telling my uncles at the time. Dad said it was standing on a good-sized limb. To this day, he said it was not a bear and not a neutrina. On to the next one. This is an Allen Parish in Louisiana. It was late in the afternoon, close to sundown. I was hunting with my dog for about an hour, when I got a strange feeling of being watched. I dismissed the feeling as another hunter being in the area watching me. After another 10 to 15 minutes, my dog ran into the thicket. He was not barking at all, which was very strange to me. I called him several times and he would not respond. Then, all at once, he started barking and after a few seconds, I heard a scream. It was so loud, I could clearly hear the sound over the dog barking. The dog quit barking, and I could hear other sounds of snapping twigs and limbs. My dog came running out of the bush right past me in the direction of my home. I called him, but he wouldn't stop. I turned back toward the area where he came from, and what I saw scared the life out of me. It was standing about 25 yards from the thicket, and I could make out the outline of something standing in the brush. It was about seven feet tall or more, and very large. The plants around him were a light brown, with some green mixed into it. The figure was a little darker. I do not remember a smell of any kind. It seemed to be looking at me, but I could tell at that distance it began to move toward me. I could see the brush moving, and I could tell that it was alive. I turned and ran and never looked back. I ran all the way home where I found my dog hiding under my dad's truck in the garage. I never have told anyone about this before. I went back hunting in the same place the next year and saw nothing else. I was questioning whether my eyes were playing tricks on me. I really don't know. It was a pin oak flat with water standing in some areas. A lot of the area is overgrown with brush and small trees, so much that a human would not get in some places. There is a very large and deep flood control canal about a half a mile to the southwest. On to the next one. In Franklin Parish in Louisiana, the only other person to hear this story was my grandmother and she has been dead for many years. 
I was hunting with my uncle on the Tensas National Wildlife Refuge. I had been lost for most of the day and was trying to find my way out of the woods when I finally found an old roadbed near a place called Hog Lake. I had walked about 200 feet down the road when I heard a noise up in front of me coming through the woods. Thinking it was my uncle looking for me, I moved forward and what I saw was beyond belief. I first saw it as it came onto the road about 50 feet in front of me. It stood about six or seven feet tall and looked like it had the mange. The hair on its body was short, and there were several bare spots on its torso and legs. It probably weighed about 250 pounds more or less. Its head was round with very small ears and almost no neck. It stood and looked at me for what seemed like an hour. Although the encounter only lasted a few seconds, at which time it slowly turned and walked back the way it came, stopping to turn and look at me only once. I have never ran so fast in my life. I made it out of the woods about one hour later and never told a soul except my grandma five years after it happened. It was during the day, about 2 p.m. or so. It was sunny with a few shadows. The area was hardwood bottoms, swamps around Hog Lake. There were some stories of strange screams, hunting dogs killed, and horses being spooked in the area. On to the next one. Harmon Leverin and his 16-year-old son, Mark, were hunting poisonous snakes in the cypress swamps near Ruddock, in St. John the Baptist Parish in Louisiana. They had taken about three shots and suddenly there was a horrible smell in the air. Harmon told Mark that maybe somebody had dragged a dead cow into the swamp. They moved to their right, trying to get away from the smell. They then heard a loud noise like something really big crashing through the branches. Up ahead, Harmon saw a tall, shaggy-looking thing with long reddish-orange hair running deeper into the swamp. About 40 feet, Harmon and Mark were busy running in the opposite direction. On to the next one. In Tangi Pahoa Parish in Louisiana. Twice, when I was 12 years old, I had an encounter. The first time my cousin and I were riding in my mini bike through a new subdivision just north of Manchac Swamp. We saw something about 500 yards away, lumbering towards us. It was upright, black, and hairy. I pointed it out to my cousin, and we agreed to turn back. We stopped a little while, backtracking and looking back, and the thing was lumbering a little faster towards us in the middle of the road. I accelerated and my cousin fell off my mini bike. I stopped. He jumped back on and yelled to go. We never looked back and never told anyone for many years. About a month later, the same cousin and I were in the woods behind the same subdivision. It was behind our farm and we were returning from the bayou when along a trail, a bush shook and a big hairy arm protruded out, grabbed some leaves and went back in. It was late in the day, and the light was fading, so we couldn't see into the bush. We ran the entire quarter of a mile home full speed. It was the last time my cousin entered the woods again. I still haven't learned my lesson. I've had some questionable experiences in recent years while in the Manchac Swamp. Other people have too, but I didn't have enough to go on to conclusively label mine. There were no birds and no sounds. It was great weather, sunny and some clouds. On to the next one. Near Shepherd in San Juanito County in Texas. One evening, a friend and I were riding my ATV through the Sam Houston National Forest while riding down a straight and rather wide trail approximately 20 yards wide. I turned around to say something to my friend who was riding as passenger. When I turned back around, there was a large humanoid creature, approximately 
six to six and a half feet tall, broad-shouldered and thick in appearance, with either dark brown or black hair covering its entire body. It spooked me, and I yelled at my passenger to look. When I yelled, the creature turned and ran into the woods. The creature made a quick turn upright and ran upright. This marks out the possibility of being a bear. My friend did not see it and asked what I was yelling about. I could not speak from awe. The creature was only approximately 40 to 50 yards in front of us in the wide open. I sped up the ATV to the location where the creature ran into the woodline. The limbs and brush were shaking back and forth, but I did not see him again due to the thick underbrush. East Texas is known for. It scared me at first and I downshifted the ATV as fast as possible and sped away stopping several hundred yards down the trail to explain to my friend what I had just seen. It was an experience I will never forget, and who knows, maybe it was meant just for me to see. I have told many people this story, most laugh, but I know what I saw. I am an avid hunter, I respect all wildlife, and have a lot of experience in the field of wildlife. There is nothing else it could have been. Like I said before, I had a clear 40 to 50 yard sighting of this creature. It was midday to early evening. The weather was clear and the visibility was good due to midday hours. It was mostly dense pine forest. There are many creeks in the area where I observed this creature. On to the next one. It was the 7th of November in 2006. Ron loaded his two horses to go elk hunting for three days in the big old mountains above Reary. He had camp set by noon, so he decided to go for a horse ride and hunt before dark. He rode up the Big Burns Creek drainage as far as Bear Trap, then tied the horses at the mouth of the canyon and walked in on foot to hunt for a few hours. He arrived back at the horses just as it was getting dark. He put his backpack on one horse and started riding the other one back to his camp. He had ridden approximately half a mile when something strange happened. Riding south along the creek, he heard a very loud, high-pitched, slightly raspy scream louder than the creek running beside him. It screamed again and again with each scream lasting three to four seconds. The screams didn't noticeably change in pitch from beginning to end. It was just an intense scream like a large animal that had just been startled. His horses froze in place because of the air current coming down the mouth of the canyon. They couldn't smell anything approaching. At first, Ron thought maybe he had run into a mountain lion but just couldn't put an animal with the scream. The sound came from the left of him, about 40 yards away from the middle of the creek. Then from the other side of him, another 40 yards away. He heard a loud whistle, followed by four or five fast verbal grunts, sounding vaguely monkey-like. The whistle sounded like the sound a man would make when trying to get someone's attention across a room. Both the whistle and grunts were loud enough that they were louder than the noise being made by the two creeks running near him. It seemed to Ron that the second being was communicating with the first one doing the screaming. I just couldn't put any animal with those down. I've hunted elk with the bow for many years, and I think I've heard just about every sound an elk can possibly make. The whistles and grunts were not coming from an elk. Elk don't scream like the scream I was hearing. Big cats don't whistle and grunt like the sound I heard from the second one. By then, he was focused and riveted to attention. He didn't have a light in his hand, but he had two flashlights in the pack tied on the second horse. After some effort, he was able to get the horse's attention away from the beings in front of them. He then was able to grab his headlamp and a flashlight and turn them on. Down in the middle of the creek, there were a pair of eyes peering back at him. 
even with the light trained on it, it kept screaming another three or four times, all the same volume, length, and intensity. Ron said that while he was concerned, he wasn't really afraid. He didn't feel he was in a life-threatening situation because the one doing the screaming wasn't moving or acting aggressive. And besides, his horses weren't acting the least bit alarmed. He said he thought maybe he was the one scaring it. I wasn't alarmed, Ron said. I could have shot them, and the thought crossed my mind. But I'm a firm believer that you don't shoot what you can't clearly see. Ron thought he must have blinked then, because all of a sudden the eyes disappeared, and he didn't see which direction it went. He sat and watched for a few more minutes. After a while, he continued on the trail toward camp. His horses both seemed reluctant, as though they could see something out there. Ron said it was just eerie. He expected something to jump out at him at any moment. He traveled down the trail another 40 yards and glanced up to the other side of the creek, and about 25 to 30 yards away, he saw two sets of eyes watching him. They were on a bank of the creek, just standing there, about level with him as he sat on his horse. One set of the eyes was higher up than the other. They were there for about a minute, then they were gone. The rest of his hunting trip went on without a hitch, but there was still a question in his mind about what he had encountered. Six months later, he traveled back to have another look at that area he had his experience. For a while after the sighting, he thought he was going crazy. But after talking with Dr. Meldrum at ISU, he understood that what he really saw was a pair of Bigfoot, and he wasn't crazy. Still, he wanted to prove it to himself. He took his son up with him this time and showed him where the sighting had taken place. He then had his son stand in the location to judge height and distance from where he had been on his horse. They also took pictures and a cast of one footprint that was still there six months after his sighting. Judging from what they found, Ron estimates that the Bigfoot was about seven or eight feet tall. The footprints they found were 16 inches long and sat about an inch into the mud. After learning all I could about these beings for the last few years, I'm 100% they were Bigfoot, Ron said. I wouldn't have traded this experience for the biggest bull elk in Idaho. I will never forget it. If this was some type of cosmic test, I think I passed it that night. On to the next one. Vaughn was in Island Park camping with a good friend, an experience that happened several times a summer when he was younger. It was late July or early August, at about 10.30 or 11 in the morning, and they were exploring a creek when they both saw something they weren't sure wasn't a bear. We were walking up one of the creeks when we both saw something that wasn't a bear, he said. Bears don't move upright, on their hind feet for long periods of time. They were about 300 yards away when they saw the Bigfoot walk across the brush and ghost into the trees in the higher ground above them. We watched it walk across the clearing for about 100 yards. He had a long, striding gait and was a dark chocolate brown. I think he was just passing through as he didn't look around or see us. He just focused on where he was heading. They didn't hear anything and were too far away to smell anything. It didn't really scare us, but it did freak us out a little bit. We hurried back to camp after seeing it. Both he and his friend were of the opinion that life exists somewhere. We humans are always making new discoveries, and this experience kind of solidified that belief. They didn't talk a lot about his experience, and... He said since that time in his life, he has lost contact with the friend. That doesn't change his belief about what he saw then, though. I have been out in the woods a lot in the last 15 years, and I haven't seen anything like that since. 
I still believe I saw Bigfoot. On to the next one. Heidi grew up in the Island Park area. She is very knowledgeable about the road, buildings, and mountains around there. She said the night she saw the Bigfoot, she was heading home from a late night, hanging out with friends. It was in the summertime, either June or July. It was almost midnight, and she was driving home on autopilot on the dirt road north of Maxon. She came to the T in the road and stopped. Just then, a Bigfoot ran across the road in front of her car. I was completely stopped. He went across the road directly in front of my car, less than three feet away, she said. It shocked me. I sat there and locked all the doors, then slowly drove home. She said it was such a shock to her senses that she kept asking herself, what just happened? She said he had to have noticed her. He had to have been aware she was sitting there in her car. There is just no other possibility. We will likely never know why he chose to cross the road there. It might be likened to why the chicken crossed the road. She describes him as being large and dark in color. He passed the side of the car toward the way she was coming from. It was a little chilly and I had the windows closed, so I have no idea if there was a smell or not. I had been goofing off with my friends, but coming home, I was all alone. There were no other witnesses. She hasn't seen anything of the Bigfoot since, but she still thinks of him each time she is on that road. On to the next one. At that time in our lives, my wife and I were not full-fledged homesteaders, but we were certainly very self-sufficient. We lived this lifestyle not out of necessity, but because we enjoyed the activities and the rewards associated with them. My wife was making some money with a mail-order rubber stamp business, and I was engaged in more than my fair share of mechanic work for many of the locals. I had an old bread truck equipped with pretty much everything that I needed for my job, with the best part of my work being that I made my own hours and determined when I would work or not. We had purchased our home for $1,800 cash, and it came with five acres of property, which had already been cleared. I also bought an old tractor from the local farmer and a couple of attachments to go along with it. Over the course of the next three years or so, we constructed a pig pen and a fairly good sized chicken coop. We also erected three greenhouses, building one per year, and not starting the next until the first was up and running. We also had wood-burning furnaces to pump some heat into the greenhouses. However, you could only use them to get things going in the early spring, the temperatures being much too cold to keep them warm prior to that time of the year. At that time, our bills were so insignificant in comparison to what we made that we wanted for nothing. We were doing very well for ourselves, and we had learned both on our own and through the help of many locals through the years how to better our homestead and how to get the most out of what we were doing, be it the pigs, chickens, or the greenhouse. Despite everything we were doing, we still needed to buy a fair number of things. We were not wiping our butt with leaves in the woods by any means. We had electricity, running water, and plumbing just like most of America. One day in late April, my wife had gone out to get some eggs when she realized that a large section of chicken wire had been torn from the coop fence. She also noticed a good deal of feathers and blood on the ground around the coop, which meant that something had broken into the coop and gotten to some of our birds. When I came home from a repair job later that same day, the two of us went out to survey the damage, and whatever had done this damage had good strength. I say this because the wire had been applied to the 6 by 6 post with 1-inch deep staples, the kind that had to be hammered in, with most of them having been pulled loose as the wire had been torn away. If you or I were to try doing the same, we would achieve nothing except getting cut and laceration. It would be that tough. 
after I had made the repairs and taken a head count of the birds lost, I learned that three chickens had been taken. I have never seen a bear here before, but I assumed that a bear had done this. The two of us started to look around for tracks and other evidence, and it was then that we started to notice some large, flat impressions in the ground. I wouldn't call them footprints because the ground was much too hard for proper print, but I will say that they appear to be flat spots on the ground, kind of like when someone tramps down gravel for a new walkway. About a week later, the hen house was ravaged during the night yet again, and my wife had discovered it in the same way she had the previous week. The wire had once again been ripped off the post, and this time a section of the plywood house had been torn away, with most of the eggs being gone or broken. Broken shells and yolks were scattered all over the place. This time, we had a little bit of a trail to follow, because whatever had tried to carry these eggs had broken or lost most of them in the process. We could now follow this trail into the edge of the wood, but no further. I consulted with a few of my neighbors, who were big-time hunters, and in the end, they were all in agreement that I had a bear problem, and that I could either trap it or kill it. Either way, all of them thought it would just keep coming back for the chickens, and maybe even the pigs. My neighbor Ernie gave me an old bear trap which I baited with some thawed raw pork, and my wife and I decided to sit up all night for however many days it would take in order to get this thing. We spent our nights sitting near a back window from which we could see the coop. The room next to us had hand crank casement windows and a door that led outside into the backyard, and I figured that when we saw the bear, I would try to get a shot off through the casement window that was cranked wide open. If not, I would then gently swing the door open and try the same. That was my plan. On the first night, we saw a fox surveying the meat in the trap. It was trying to cautiously reach its snout over the trap and take a bite, but for some reason, it was afraid to commit fully and wandered off without having eaten anything. On the second night's watch, we saw nothing from our post, but that same day, my wife went out to check on the greenhouse and found the back end of one of the houses was torn open. It looked like something had opened the door and forced its way through the frame, because it was too big to walk through the door. At least, that was my impression at the time. All of this must have happened while we were awake and watching the coop, because we couldn't see that end of the greenhouse from where we were. We had also somehow heard nothing, and when we went inside, there were gigantic footprints in the vegetable bed throughout the greenhouse. We had staked the bed with metal every four feet for strength, and they were filled with the softest, loamy soil you could imagine. Why, a grasshopper could have left a footprint in here. Whatever had walked through here had pulled out most of the small plants and eaten them. Its weight had compressed the loam down to its base, which was about 12 to 14 inches of depth in total. The prints were perfectly formed by gigantic human-like feet, the only difference being the shaping of the toes, which were very broad and angled kind of funny. Just so you understand, each greenhouse had six boxes in them that were 16 by 12 feet. Between these boxes were pea gravel pathways to walk on when you were tending to the vegetables. And whatever this animal was had walked right into the bed, grabbed whatever it wanted, and left. I called in the local game warden, and when he had arrived and saw what had been done, he was speechless. He was a young man, and all he could say was it looked like a giant walked through our bed. Later that morning, I called some of the men over to have a look, and one fellow named George, who was an old-timer in the area, said that he wouldn't have believed it if he hadn't seen it with his own eyes, but that this looked like the work of the hairy man of the wood. He then went on to speak about a giant gorilla, or hair-covered man, who had attacked people and killed livestock in days gone by, according to the locals. However, none of them had heard of or seen anything of that sort in their lifetime. George started saying that whatever this is needed to be put down as soon as possible. We were all in agreement that with feet that size, we could only imagine what the rest of it would look like.
Together, we had devised a plan. We were going to leave everything else in the yard as it had always been, including the now damaged greenhouse. One of the boys had a Winnebago mobile home, and we were going to station in the mobile home in the yard where all aspects of the greenhouse, the pen, and the coop could be seen. We would then stake out the property from within the Winnebago, with our rifles at the ready. The men were all fired up, and everyone wanted to be in on the action. Two days later, we were all dressed for hunting and sitting in the truck with the louvered windows open and the door ajar. In the middle of the night, one of the guys pointed toward the pig pen, but said nothing. The pig pen was most visible from the Winnebago's door, and, as fate would have it, it was the hardest part of the vehicle to see from, but he could see a bit, and that was enough for now. We were all trying to get some kind of look toward the pen, which was almost completely devoid of light. As I focused my eyes, I could make out the pigs with their lightly colored skin all huddled together on one end of the pen, which is something they would only do when trying to escape from a predator. Next, I saw a large dark mass come into view, and at the same time, all the pigs ran to the other side of the pen and out of our view. Ernie mouthed the words, it's there, let's go, while pointing his finger emphatically at the pen. We jumped out and Ernie fired the first shot as I and Joe Hollander followed. We were all out. This place was lit up like the 4th of July. We must have shot 30 rounds into the darkness and Ernie was certain that he had hit his mark with the first shot, saying that he had his sight right on it. We all looked around for blood or anything else that would indicate it had been hit, but we found nothing. We all had been hoping for a scenario where several guys would take it down, but as it turned out, the first guys out the small door was going to have the only shot worth taking, especially when you're shooting in the dark at something that is dark itself. The next day, I did manage to find some blood on the ground right where Ernie had said he'd hit his mark. He was firing an M1 from the Korean conflict, and one would think that would have had to hurt at 30 yards. The pen had a fence around it that was six feet tall, and the black mass that I had seen was at least four or five feet taller than that, than the top of the fence, and appeared to be very large in every sense of the word. At any rate, all of the activity around our house ceased after that night, though we had been successful even if we hadn't seen a dead body. I filed a report with the warden about what we had done, and he was more than a little peeved about us firing in the dark at an unknown target. But all's well that ends well, I guess, and it did end well. On to the next one. When a Grays Harbor deputy sheriff driving up a deserted back road in the middle of the night spotted an eight-foot-tall hairy, muscular something in his headlights, he set off the Great Ocean Shore's Sasquatch watch. The legendary Sasquatch, which is a West Coast cousin of the Abominable Snowman, is deep in First Nation and woods lore all the way from Northern California up beyond British Columbia. Does it exist? If it doesn't, it might as well. For last week, all the rumors and reported sightings and hearings for several years back all focused at Ocean Shores. It was 2.30 a.m. Sunday, July 27th, when Deputy Verling Harrington, an officer noted for his serious approach to his job, was driving up DK Road about 10 miles northwest of Ocean Shores. His headlights picked out a hairy female, seven and one half to eight feet tall, with a head, torso, fingered hands, and 18-inch long feet covered with hair. Was it a bear? Harrington doesn't think so. Black bears don't get that tall. Besides, said Harrington, I never saw a sow bear with breasts that high up on her chest. Harrington reported his Sasquatch sighting to the sheriff, Pat Gallagher, and probably regretted it later. After the county became a crawl with newsmen, Gallagher himself leaned toward the bear theory, but that didn't cool the story down much. The Seattle Post-Intelligencer sent down a two-man crew and described the story as more fantastic than an Ocean Shores press release. Ocean Shores young people 
had been talking about Sasquatch about three weeks prior to Harrington's sighting. Teenager Ruth Foss, at an evening party near Duck Lake, looked out the window and saw something big and hairy under a streetlight. Other guests at the party affirmed they saw something loping off in the darkness. They searched for tracks, but found none. It has been a very dry July and August. It was recalled that last summer, in roughly the same area, two teenage boys camping out heard something large prowling around the tent, and in the morning found a well-defined track, though with no toe mark, in wet sand at the edge of the lake. Then, a week after Deputy Harrington had his encounter, two women driving at night on a side road out of Malone, east of Elma, passed a Sasquatch standing beside the road, went on to an intersection, and turned around. When they came back to the scene, the animal was still there, but moved off into the darkness. Last Thursday, a five-man work crew near the headwork of Tahola Water Systems on the Quintanal Reservation was subjected to a barrage of large rocks, a fairly common Sasquatch activity. According to backcountry lore, Sasquatches have been blamed for crushing ridge poles of isolated cabins with watermelon-sized boulders and tumbling rocks down on pickups in isolated roads. The Tahola work crew said those rocks came uphill and one of them was weighed later at more than four pounds. The crew declined to work until a gun-carrying guard was brought in. Even then, said the foreman, there was a lot of standing around looking at the woods. The crew moved its activities closer to town. About this time into the area came René de Hinden, a Canadian who has spent 15 years and $100,000, he says, in a frustrating research trying to get hard physical proof of the existence of the large gorilla-like creature. De Hinden, a construction worker from Vancouver, B.C., is familiar with the wild. He has interviewed scores of persons who say flatly they have seen Sasquatches and more who tend to be tight-lipped about their own experiences. Sadly, De Hinden says he's never seen a Sasquatch himself, but he has measured, photographed, and otherwise recorded hundreds of their tracks from the Fraser Valley down to Mount Shasta. Something makes the tracks De Hinden points out, and we can tell from the area and compaction tests that whatever it is weighs from 600 to 800 pounds. If we can prove the existence of these creatures, it will be one of the greatest scientific discoveries of the age. All the books will have to be rewritten. On to the next one. In Stevens County, Washington, a hairy humanoid was seen in a garbage dump by a butcher named Joseph Road. The man beast left 17 and a half inch long by 7 inch wide footprints with very human appearance. At the front of the foot, it was twisted inward and kidney shaped and indicated dislocation of bones along the outer rim. The third toe was also squeezed out of normal alignment. On to the next one. My name is S.H. At the time of the sighting, I was attending WSU and had to return home from college for some things I needed to take care of. I left Pullman late in the afternoon and did not get to the White Pass area until sometime after 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning. It was dark and in the fall. I guess it was around the first part of November. The year was 1969 and I was a sophomore in college. I was coming down the west side of the pass and was just past the Chinook Pass cutoff and was headed around the big sweeping corner that was near the bottom of the hill when my headlight picked up on the right side of the car, something moving and coming up the side of the road. Since this was a bank, I first saw the head and then as it moved up the bank more of its body became visible. It did not look at me or the headlights of the car. I slowed down as I was not sure what it was going to do, and moved into the left-hand lane. I remember thinking, what is that, a bear? No, but I had no explanation of what I was seeing. As I slowed down, the animal, which was standing on two legs, stepped over the guardrail and turned to start walking up the hill. The animal acted as if I was not even there. 
It did not seem startled or scared or frightened. It was like I was not even there. The size of it must have been eight feet tall or taller as the guardrail was of little difficulty for the animal to step over. It never looked directly at me, but seemed to be moving with a purpose. The animal was completely covered with hair with long arms. It did not have the typical bare head and pointed nose, nor did it look like an ape either. Its movement was very graceful and smooth, and, as I mentioned, walked upright. The hair on the animal in the headlight seemed black, but with brown highlights. The whole sighting probably lasted no more than 15 seconds. As I passed by it, in the left lane, it had turned to walk up the hill. As I drove down the road, I tried to rationalize what it was I saw. It was not a bear or an ape like we see in the zoo. I have often thought I was seeing things having driven so far without stopping, but still I am clear I saw something that I have never seen before. I did not turn around and go back, although I thought about it, but felt that it would have been long gone, having seen this animal years ago and have kept it to myself. But the other reported sightings in the Chronicle caused me to add verification to what it was I saw that evening. It was 1 to 2 a.m. in the morning. It was a clear night, no rain as I recall, and no snow yet in the mountains. As I was headed west, on the left side of the car was a steep rock wall, and on the right where the animal came from was forest and brush. It came walking straight up the side of the road bank. I don't remember it using its hand. On to the next one. In Skamania County, Washington, Mrs. Louise Baxter saw a hairy humanoid crossing the road in front of her car. It was daytime, and she described the creature as a coconut brown color and covered with shaggy and dirty brown hair. The mouth had large square teeth set into a big head, set right into the shoulders with apparently no neck, and there was hair two inches long on the head. The creature had a jutting chin, a receding forehead, a wide nose with big nostrils, and glowing amber eyes. On to the next one. I lived at Phoenix, near Stevens Pass, Washington, in the 60s and 70s. There had been sightings of Sasquatch near our home, and at that time, my husband and I laughed about that and never taking them seriously. I lived at Phoenix about 10 years and enjoyed taking walks by myself with my Samoyed dog. That dog would chase bears away, running them up trees. I always felt safe with her around. One morning, the dog went with my husband to work, and I decided to take a walk down to the end of the road toward Highway 2. It was a beautiful spring day, and the snow still lay in places on the ground. I can still see and hear it like it was yesterday. I had crossed the small bridge going over the small creek by our place and gotten almost to the end of the road where it meets the highway. That's when I heard the most god-awful sound. The sound was quite close to me. I'm thinking about half a block distance as the crow flies and seemed to be coming around the area where the deserted railroad bank houses were located, where the depot was located. This animal had huge lungs. The volume was immense. I'm trying to think of a word for the sound. It started sort of like a roar and went to a shrill pitch, then a pause of about three seconds, and then the same sound with that shrill pitch, a pause of three seconds, and then another sound. That was it, and since I didn't believe in Sasquatch, I wasn't scared of it, just curious. I knew all the calls of the animals around our mountains, and this wasn't the same. I've tried all these years to figure out what made that noise. I stopped into the Forestry Service office after this happened and asked them if they had ever heard the sound. I was trying to explain it to them the best I could, but they never took me serious. I've received the same response from my friends that live near Skokomish. Then, after I moved to Spokane, sometime later, I was watching Unsolved Mysteries. They played sounds that sounded very similar, and I said to myself, there's the sound or closest to it. I thought, no one's going to believe this. I worked at a hospital in Spokane, and one of my Indian patients and I got to talking about my experience. 
she had seen Sasquatch come into her camp as a young girl and chased it away by beating on a drum. She said the most astounding thing she remembers about her experience was the human look in its eyes. So the Native Americans have known about them for years. I truly think the Sasquatch would be found around that area of scenic, near Stevens Pass, Washington. For 10 years, I walked all through those mountains, my small children with me, and the Sasquatch never bothered us. The next day, I checked the area where the bunkhouses were and saw and heard nothing more. About a year or two before I heard my sound, there were kids from the University of Washington that said they had seen a Sasquatch. They were looking around above our house at Scenic, going through a railroad tunnel looking for it. My husband and I were out for a walk and noticed these huge boulders rolling down the mountainside. My husband and I were looking up toward the mountain, wondering what was going on. I said to him, what the heck is going on up there? He laughed, saying the fool kid said they saw a Sasquatch and are looking for it. Now, I'm not so sure. On to the next one. I had purchased a framed copy of Thomas Moran's painting, The Golden Gate. It was painted in 1893, depicting an area of Yellowstone National Park 22 years after Moran had visited the area as a member of the Hayden Expedition of 1871. It depicts a magnificent view, looking down through the canyon with the river flowing below and the falls cascading in the distance. For years, I stood and stared at this painting on my living room wall in an attempt to experience what Moran had so many years before. I thought about the hardships they must have endured, and yet, out of everything, this magnificent masterpiece had emerged, which to me proved that adversity fuels greatness. This is, after all, the way in which a diamond is formed from a common lump of coal after having been placed under great pressure for many years. I had often thought about visiting the location in the painting for myself to experience firsthand that which had inspired Moran to paint such a masterpiece. After much planning and saving, the day came that I found myself hiking into Yellowstone, heading toward the very same area where Moran's inspiration had been sparked. In June, at 11 o'clock in the morning, I was standing with a photograph of the painting in hand in the very spot where Moran had stood. It was a rugged hillside tucked in between two adjacent mountains, with the valley having been cut by the river's waters over millions of years. Surrounding me and below me, just as Moran had painted it, were gigantic boulders of every shape and size, with scrubby pines growing both in and around and threw them on the slope. It was a magnificent sight to behold. I could smell the river, the stones, the soil around me, and I paused to ponder those men who had seen this for the first time in 1871. This tract of land, as well as the land west of the Mississippi, had been acquired by President Thomas Jefferson in 1803, in a deal that had been struck between him and Napoleon's France. On my right-hand side was basically a sheer rock face, with a trail cut through it about midway, the entirety of it being devoid of any plant life. To my left-hand side was a similar rock face, which had a somewhat rounded top covered in mostly pines, the sides of which sloped down midway to meet the river's edge. This side had a tremendous amount of tree growth associated with it throughout. I had been sitting in this area for well over two hours, being in no hurry whatsoever to leave, when I saw two darkly colored figures coming up the slope to my left, ascending from the river in the valley below. They appeared as two black ants would crawling across tan-colored sand, the slope on which they were moving having no plant life on it whatsoever, allowed me to see their outline perfectly. As I put my binoculars on them, the distance was still too great for me to see with great clarity, but one was taller than the other. And 
They were both walking on two legs. The creatures were climbing a slope, which had to be a 50 degree incline, and were doing so rapidly without the aid of any walking poles or the like. This slope had to be several hundred yards or better, after which it met with a sheer cliff of some 200 feet, which was crowned with trees. I could tell as I watched them that their arms and their legs were abnormally long, as compared to their torsos. They were taking what I would call very long and athletic strides in human standards. As they ascended the slope, when they had reached this cliff where the grade changed from, say, 60 degrees to vertical, the creatures began to scale the rock wall like two spiders. There was no break or a spite taken by either of them in doing so. They had just ascended a very steep slope at a record pace and were now scaling a sheer rock face at a rate that didn't seem humanly possible. The reality was that they were not human. Exactly what they were at the time, I could not say. They appeared to be the coloration of a chocolate Labrador dog. Without the aid of any climbing gear whatsoever, these creatures scaled this cliff face with the ease of walking up a flight of stairs. I was mesmerized as I watched them. The creature who had taken the lead on the climb, having reached the top, simply stood up and walked into the trees, with the second following shortly thereafter. Looking back, I now realized that I was watching two Bigfoot. It made me wonder if Moran and the expedition crew hadn't run into the same in 1871. I guess with magnificent landscape comes magnificent creatures, and I had just seen two of them. The most incredible aspect of this sighting was the strength and athleticism exhibited by these creatures. What they accomplished in a matter of 10 minutes would have taken experienced hikers and climbers hours. This entire sighting was the icing on the cake as far as my journey was concerned. It was a day that I will never forget. On to the next one. For decades, tales of mysterious people inhabiting the deep woods of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park have persisted. These range all the way from reports of hairy wild men to entire families or groups of feral cannibals. For some conspiracy theorists, these wild feral people are said to account for the unexplained disappearances in the National Park. In particular, they have been blamed for the disappearance of young Dennis Martin, the six-year-old boy who vanished near the Cade Cove area in June of 1969. Even retired park ranger and legendary tracker Dwight McCarter, who was the lead in the Dennis Martin disappearance and many others during his long career, admits that there were wild men who lived deep within the recesses of the National Park. Some claim that these wild men are in fact the cryptic creature also known as Bigfoot. There have been Bigfoot sightings throughout the whole of the Appalachia. So if the creature does indeed exist, the Great Smokies Natural Park would be the perfect area for them to inhabit. The Cherokee have legends and stories of these hairy giants who were already inhabitants of the land before the Cherokee came into the area thousands of years ago. Other people claim that these wild men, some say there are women and children too, are not Bigfoot at all, but rather inbred and untamed humans who have lived their entire lives deep in the woods. They dress in animal skins, hunt and forage for their food, build their own settlements, and so on. Naturally, they don't take kindly to strangers and have been known to kill any interlopers who dare to enter their secret domain, whether by accident or design, and they have been known to eat them as well. Yes, that's correct. The rumors and legends and tales from the dark hills and hollers of the Great Smoky Mountains, as well as other parts of Appalachia, are not only isolated inbred and demented, they lean towards cannibalism as well. Although the average person will tell you that this is preposterous, 
and there's no way humans, even wild, hairy, inbred ones who have the occasional craving for human flesh, could hide out in the mountains undetected. I counter with this. Have you ever been to the Smokies? Now, I'm not talking about Gatlinburg or any of the touristy areas. I'm not even talking about the myriad of trails that run through the park, which are hiked by millions of hikers every year. I'm talking about deep in the woods, really deep. There are places off trail that it's possible no human has ever set foot, not even the settlers or the Cherokee or possibly even Bigfoot. The Great Smoky Mountains National Park covers over half a million acres. Let that number settle in. Half a million, 522,427 acres to be exact, as per the National Park Service website. Unless you've been in the deep woods, there are no trails, no markers, no anything other than you and the forest. It's almost impossible to comprehend just how vast this wilderness is indeed. The ruggedness of the National Park which sits on the border of eastern Tennessee and western North California. In fact, it's almost divided evenly between the two states, has to be experienced to be believed. It's in these giant old-growth forests that you begin to realize just how small and infinitesimal a person is compared to the wilderness. It's no wonder people die out here, especially those who are ill-equipped and ill-prepared. All that to say is that there are plenty of places, an almost innumerable number of places, that a person or even a group of people could hide out for an indefinite amount of time. If you have the basic rough necessities, food, water, shelter, which are in abundance here, if you know what you're doing, there would be no reason to ever leave those woods. Case in point, Eric Robert Rudolph, also known as the Olympic Park Bomber, successfully hid out in the Nanthahala National Forest, which is 533,000 acres expanse of wilderness in western North Carolina and along the Appalachian Trail headed toward the Great Smokies. Rudolph managed to elude the FBI for five years and was only caught in 2003 because he left the forest and was rummaging through a trash dumpster in Murphy, North Carolina, where he was spotted by a rookie police officer who recognized him from the FBI 10 most wanted list. If this man with only minimal survival skills managed five years, imagine the skills of someone who has never left these woods in their entire lives. As a possibility, it must be considered. Cases like this, hearing rumors even of the wild men and cannibals, families of people living like this their whole lives, make me question our very humanity as a species. Did society and what the majority consider socially normal or acceptable tame us and take away our very instincts and our human nature? At their base, feral humans are simply people who have grown up and lived their entire lives without outside human contact. Let's take a closer look at these alleged sightings of these wild and feral people and communities which seem to be springing up more and more in recent years, or at the very least, taking the blame for what's been going on with these missing clusters. Though our focus is the Great Smokies, these communities and lone people are all over the world, in all the deepest forests and woods. Sometimes they're even raised by animals, mainly wolves, and are therefore without any kind of human instincts to speak of. No morals, the morals of a wild beast, a feral animal who will attack at the scent of a human and or their blood. And this is most likely why these people are being blamed for many of the missing clusters. One of the earliest reported accounts of a feral human is the somewhat obscure tale of a bizarre individual who came to be known as Wild Peter. In 1724, in Germany, some men were hunting deep in the woods what they were hunting for has been lost to time and retelling, but what they came upon that day has never been forgotten. Imagine how startled and surprised these men were when, out of some deep and thick woods, emerged a small boy. He was on all fours like an animal, and at first was only recognized by the men 
at a naked, brownish-black-haired creature, the men were astonished and tried their best to coax the wild boy out of the thicket so they could capture him. But all attempts failed, and the lad turned and ran at an inhuman speed back into the depths of the forest. The boy was estimated to be about 12 years old, and when the men reported what they had seen, they found they weren't the only ones who had seen this boy creature. He had been a haunt to the area for a long time, and was even known to climb trees with the ease of a bear, though he snarled and growled and walked on all fours like a wolf. The child was eventually captured by another group of hunters and brought to King George himself, who was already visiting the area. The king was fascinated by the child, who was partially fond of eating raw vegetables and meat, who had no concept or knowledge of speech, and who seemed to love to tear apart and devour live birds. King George loved the little creature boy and named him Peter. He was shipped off to England to be studied by the best and most well-respected academics. The thing about Peter, though, was that he was also a pickpocket. How did he learn this behavior? He wouldn't eat bread or anything cooked and abhorred being bathed. Cases of wild Peter just show that this has been going on most likely since the dawn of time. With technology, it's just becoming harder to hide. It's becoming harder for these lone people or their communities to stay off the radar. On July 13, 1973, a seasonal National Park ranger named Charles Hugh had a violent encounter with what is known as the Wild Man of Catalucci. While checking up on fishermen looking for licenses, he encountered a large man with a heavy beard and a fly rod. Hughes asked for the man's name and whether or not he had a fishing license. The man replied, I've got no name. I've lived in these woods all my life. When he asked about the fishing license, the man reached into his jacket and pulled out a pistol. Though the ranger managed to disarm the man during a scuffle, he wasn't able to fully subdue him. As Hughes tried to drive off in his jeep to get assistance in detaining the man, a giant rock was thrown through the jeep window. Hughes was able to get to a nearby station for backup, and a large group of rangers and volunteers used bloodhounds and tracked the wild man well into the night. They were never able to find any trace of him. Subsequently, a popular song came out of the encounter, and, of course, much discussion and speculation about this encounter came out in public through the press. This story and many more live on and have been added to and exaggerated upon to this very day. Despite these additions to the story, the fact remains the same. These men and children, even women, do exist, and they are seemingly very dangerous to encounter. There is another side to all of this as well. Thus far, we have been talking about the feral and wild people who have lived their entire lives in the wilderness and have no idea of civilization, some of whom are even taken in and raised by wild and deadly animals. This seems to defy Mother Nature herself, but... What about the people who choose to live off-grid and purposely set out to live wild and possibly feral? There are so many reports, especially in recent years, of encounters with these wild and or feral men. Does the ease in which they are able to accomplish this and their ability to just slip into this life of no contact with humanity and no creature comfort or worldly pleasures just show us we are one step maybe even one accidental flip from being this way in the first place. Is wild and feral living what humanity was really made for? The concept of people choosing to live this way is something most of us can't even fathom, yet it fascinates us nonetheless, fascinates and terrifies us. Jeff Holland has a rather famous account of his encounter with a feral human in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains, which he describes in detail it happened right near Cloudbitter Rock in 1990. The author says he encountered a white male in his mid to late 30s, naked, but for being covered in leaves, mud, and vines. These were also matted into his hair and beard, both of which were filthy and unkempt. As much of the young man's appearance was, Holland described the man as having an absurd swamp thing appearance. The wild man's walk was ape-like and hunched over. After maintaining eye contact for what seemed like an eternity, 
the ape-like, feral man turned and ran off into the depths of the wood and forest. This brought up an interesting thought. Is this how they're able to kidnap and stalk humans so easily? Thinking about the description of both the Jeff and many others have given of these people, it's come to my attention how easily they would just blend into the environment. There's a strong and strange feeling that somehow, if they do not want to be seen, they won't. Of course, one can be caught by surprise every now and then, but the reports are almost always the same, with a few exceptions here and there, that they turn and run at an almost inhuman and cat-like speed back into the wilderness from which they came. We must also keep in mind what the Great Smokies were before they became a national park. It was actually a mountain range that was full of mountain communities which were thriving, such as Cades Cove and Cataluchi. If you go all the way back to the 1700s, you'll find a very different atmosphere than today. And that's putting it lightly, Hernando de Soto discovered the Cherokee tribes in the Smokies during his 1540 exploration, which brought the European settlers into the area. Those of the Cherokee who didn't want to adapt and conform to European culture of the time were forced to go to Oklahoma, which is what the Trail of Tears is. Fast forward to the early 1900s, and you'll see the people finally start to utilize the beautiful and bountiful resources of the land. They were farming hunting, raising livestock, and even cutting down trees to build their own homes. Forests then became towns and pastures, none of which you will see there today. As the years went by, families gave way to lumbering. Farming gave way to lumbering. As logging towns began popping up all over the Smokies, inevitably the geography started to transform, and much of the forests had been cleared away, with nothing replanted to grow in their place. At the rate they were clearing and logging, the trees would have become extinct and there would be no national forest like we know today. At least not the Great Smokies. In 1934, Congress and Franklin Roosevelt chartered and dedicated the park to protect it from being cleared and built on anymore. Is it so much of a stretch to believe that some people are more interested in living as our ancestors did in the Smokies back in the 15, 16, and 1700s and so on? On to the next one. In August, somewhere between Cleveland and Columbus in Ashland County, in one of the little campsite areas along State Route 3, from what he recalls, I was lost out in the woods while camping with my parents somewhere in central Ohio, and this large female ape-like creature put me back in our camp. Then I started screaming, and my parents, who were out looking for me, heard me and came back to the camp and found me. I drew a picture of the creature when I was five years old. I have not showed this picture to many people because they would have thought I was crazy. I was a lawyer in Summit County for nearly 40 years, and I did not need any aspersions cast upon my sanity. I am grateful to that blessed creature for my life, and I would like to honor her memory in some way. My dad thought that he might have seen some tracks of some kind. The night was rainy, maybe a few hours before dark. On to the next one. In Cleveland, in Chehoiga County, Ohio, there were quite a few reports of a monster man dwelling in the old cemetery near the zoo. When a new highway was put through, the man was said to have moved into the nearby woods. On to the next one. Miss Emily Magnan and her husband were disturbed by her neighbor's dog. They also smelled an odor like a swamp. The next door neighbor went out to investigate and, 15 feet away, saw a three-foot-tall little man entirely covered with twigs and foliage. Whenever she turned on the porch light, the little man disappeared, but would reappear in the same place when it was turned off. This was in Loveland Heights. On to the next one. In Vinton County in Ohio, when my sister was a little girl growing up on my grandparents' farm, 
she was left to entertain herself quite a bit. This was a very rural setting, and no one thought twice about leaving her alone in the yard. She claims to have been within a few feet of a Bigfoot in the yard, and when she ran into the farmhouse, she says the creature followed. She then hid behind a couch and watched the creature look around for a short moment, then turn and leave. No one was in the house at the time. She never spoke of this incident to anyone until she was in her 30s. We were back on the farm for a family reunion and went into the Southie State Forest for a drive on the fire roads. We heard this high-pitched kind of roar, something none of us had ever heard before except my sister. She got kind of panicky and asked if we could leave then. On the way back to the farm, she looked at me and said she had heard that sound before. She told me about her childhood incident, and knowing my sister, I could feel the fear in her words. A few years later, one of my uncles and his family were on the back side of the farm with his family and the tractor. They were out cutting wood and just enjoying the day when they all at the same time caught a whiff of what they describe as a pungent, musty smell, strong and nauseating. My uncle told everyone to jump on the wagon, and they immediately left the area. To this day, he won't say why he rushed off in such a hurry. My cousins say he just said, don't look back, which brings us to my experience. I have been camping on that hill in southeastern Ohio since I can remember. I've camped alone and with many people. I have never been so scared in my life as I was that summer night. Mike, my buddy, and I were camping there. We had turned in around midnight, and it must have been about three to four in the morning when I was awakened by this deep, growling grunt that sounded like it was just a few feet from our tent. The campfire was smoldering really bad, and the smoke trail was really thick. It sounded like whatever was out there got a big snoot full of the smoke and was trying to clear its nostrils. The sound was too deep for a deer, and we think if it was a bear, there are only a few in this region. It would have come into camp for food or trouble. I listened for a few minutes before I woke Mike. He is a shoot now, ask questions later kind of guy, so he could hear it also. About the time he was ready to blast out the back of my tent, we could hear the brush rustling as it moved away from us. Later that morning, after we woke, I was convinced it was a Bigfoot and set out to look for tracks, fur, broken sticks, you know, the usual signs. Well, I didn't find any Bigfoot footprints, but then I didn't find any sign of deer or bear activity either. We also didn't notice any odor at the time of the noises either, but our campfire was at the north side of the tent and the wind was blowing south, so all we smelled was campfire smoke, and the creature smell was probably being carried south away from us. I believe this area of the country would be a good place for Sasquatch. It is in southeastern Ohio, hilly, thick woods, some patchy clear areas, quiet, non-populated except during deer season. It is a very serene area. On to the next one. In Noble County in Ohio, the closest town was Harrietville. While doing some yard chores, we noticed a series of tracks going into the hollow on our property. Upon examination, we realized these were very large, barefoot, human-like tracks. They were close to 13 inches long and over 6 inches wide at the toes. They were leading into some thickets, so we decided not to follow. What impressed us more than anything was the stride between the tracks. The stride was at least four and a half to five feet long. Being very familiar with bears, we knew these were not bear tracks because of the enormous size, lack of claws, and human-like shape. The game warden came out the next day to view the tracks. He had no idea what could have made the tracks, especially anything native to Ohio. To this day, we have no clue what could have made those tracks. It was around 5 p.m. There was snow on the ground, and it was cold out. 
It was on the backside of our 190-acre farm. It is a heavily wooded, hollow with plenty of rolling hills all around. We had a very large black bear on our property the previous year. I witnessed it at close range, and its tracks were visible on many occasions. These tracks were in no way similar to the tracks mentioned before. They were much smaller in size. On to the next one. At Mansfield in Richland County in Ohio, a Charles Mill Reservoir, Michael Lane, Wayne Armstrong, and Denny Patterson, teenagers, saw a strange creature rear up at them off the ground directly in front of them. It had glowing green eyes and no arms were visible. The creature left strange tracks at the site which resembled the footgear worn by skin divers. On to the next one. Author Michael Newton discussed the famed Owlman sightings in Cornwall before going on to note that the Owlman also appears in the history of Canada. As early as 1798, a Canadian settler in his diary noted the story of a church that was haunted by a man or his ghost, capable of transforming himself into a gigantic owl. This remarkable occurrence happened in York, which is now part of Toronto. In 1811, newspaper carried the accounts of several farmers and their servants who reported a kind of winged man with tiny features, save for huge luminous eyes. Newton notes that over a hundred sightings of the Ontario Owlman were given during the 19th century, with almost all of them describing a thin male figure with wings either sprouting from its back or taking the place of normal arms. The Owlman was most often seen after darkness had fallen, and it frequented graveyards and isolated forest lands. First Nations people in British Columbia reported attacks by a creature they called Tatakala, or the Owl Woman Monster, in 1918. These beings, who were said to be five sister ogres, were taller than normal humans and devoured anyone they could catch. These creatures were enough of a threat that the five owl women were hunted and killed as World War I was ending. While many people of the time dismissed these reports as the superstitious rambling of savages, we should note that whatever was haunting these First Nations folk was solid enough to hunt down and exterminate. Moving further into the 20th century, Jerome Clark relates the sighting of a giant bird. According to this account, two tourists in Alberta who were visiting Consolation Valley in the Rockies spotted what they thought was an eagle. As the bird approached a 7,500-foot-high peak called the Tower of Babel, the two noted that this avian was huge and brown and, even more unsettling, carrying a large animal in its talons. Apparently, the shout from the witnesses startled the birds, which dropped what turned out to be a young 15-pound mule deer. Please note that bird scientists hold that the eagle can only attack and carry away small mammals, reptiles, fish, and some other birds. While there is some debate about what a large eagle can carry, 15 pounds is several pounds beyond even the top estimate experts say an eagle can carry. So, this bird must have been a whopper. Witness Don Nice reported that in the 1970s, he encountered a huge bird while towing boxes of fish with a snowmobile near the Manitoba settlement of Puck. Nice states that he stopped to check on his load and straighten it when he saw what he thought was an airplane. The subject was puzzled, as there was no sound. The creature, which Nice stated was not like any bird he had ever seen before, flew so low over him that he could have thrown a ball and hit the creature. He estimated the wingspan at 30 feet or more, and the length of the body a little less than that. 
the giant bird was dark gray in color with some orange around the tail. Nice presumed that the feet were tucked up in shadow under the creature's belly. The body of the animal reminded the witness of the fuselage of a small airplane with a head blunt like a frog's but a little more pointed. Oddly, after describing the animal as a bird, the witness noted that it did not seem to have any feathers and stated that the wings were more like a bat. In either event, bird or bat, there are no known examples of either type of animal with a 30-foot wingspan. There also comes a story of two brothers out deer hunting near Lake Winnipegosis. The pair had brought down a deer, and one of them had driven a car around to pick the carcass up. As he searched for his hunting knife, his brother cautioned him not to move. When the brother in the car looked up, he was astonished to see two massive golden eagles standing next to the deer. The two eagles eyed the brothers for a while, then one of them vocalized, and the other hopped onto the deer carcass and carried it away like nothing. These eagles were man-sized when they were standing on the ground. If a man-sized eagle can carry off a full-grown deer on its own, then the larger varieties, sometimes sighted, might be able to carry off something as large as a moose. There have been several stories from native people tracking moose who had seen the trail mysteriously disappear. Perhaps these moose had met up with one of the deluxe economy-sized eagles. At the time of the sighting, John was living in a high-rise apartment complex on the 17th floor. He actually spotted the creature from his balcony twice, but on the first occasion dismissed it as a low-flying aircraft, possibly smuggling drugs. At dawn on a Sunday morning, however, John's perception of the aircraft changed when he had an opportunity to see the creature up close. Again, the monster bird soared without flapping its wings. The Thunderbird was at John's eye level on the 17th floor, and he reported that the thing had a wingspan of 40 to 50 feet with a beak approximately two feet long. John hid behind a partition that kept the creature from seeing him and continued to observe, describing the Thunderbird as resembling a cross between a hawk and a raven with a hooked beak. When John came out from behind the partition, the creature was no more than 30 feet from his balcony and angling off to the north, where the witness conjectured it might be going after caribou. John stated that he spoke with a native elder who told him that such animals did indeed exist and that he knew where they congregated, perching on cliffs. Here comes a sighting of a witness who lived about a kilometer west of Lake Magog in Quebec. The first hint of trouble that the person reported was snarling sounds in the nearby marsh, but the situation soon escalated when a neighbor's llama disappeared. Police found no evidence of tracks or blood at the scene. On a Sunday night, the witness was out in the property greenhouse and started to move out of the structure upon hearing a loud noise near the utility shed. As the witness exited, he heard the loud snarls again and went back into the greenhouse. He extinguished the lights and observed while calling his wife to let her know what was happening. More noises emanated from the area of the utility shed, so the witness kept quiet watch, including something that he characterized as a shrieking sound. Abruptly, a security light on a movement sensor near the driveway came on, and the subject spotted the creature. The witness described the cryptid as follows. A huge winged creature with a long, thin tail. It was hideous. Looked like it had bat skin and short horns on weird snake-like head. It opened its wings at one point. I'd say the wingspan was at least eight meters. I didn't notice feather. It stood about three to four meters high as well. It was snarling and thrashing its head as it ran toward the marsh. I really know of no animal to reference it to. Kari, a witness who resides in Kenora, Ontario, at the time of the sighting. Kari and her then-partner were in the habit of driving into Winnipeg, Manitoba, every week 
as they had family and friends in the city. As the couple made the drive to Winnipeg one summer, in the late evening, they both noted something blotting out the headlights of oncoming cars. Whatever it was flew into the range of the car's headlights, and Kari reported that she and her partner saw a being that was black skin, bald like an unclothed human, but it was flying lower to ground height of our Tacoma truck's light, and it shielded its face from the light by flipping its wings up. Though the episode was over within a matter of seconds, Kari noted that she thought she could not estimate the wingspan of the creature. Its wings did seem proportional to its body. As an artist, the witness noted that the being's wings resembled those of a bat. Kari's sighting affected her deeply, making her unable to be herself for some time after the incident. Fortunately, the fear did fade over time, and the witness was eventually able to travel alone at night once more. In an incident dubbed as the Ottawa Angel Incident, the subject gives a lengthy report and description of a being that she sighted on her drive from the suburb of Maitland into the Canadian capital of Ottawa. The date was September 17, 2013, and the weather was clear but windy on that fall day. The witness was on her way to meet a friend for coffee in the city, moving down the highway at a quick 120 kilometers per hour. When she noted what she at first identified as a really large seagull in the distance ahead of her. As the subject moved closer to the seagull, she realized that she was seeing something quite extraordinary and described a humanoid figure, massive through the chest and arms, with white hawk-like feathers, feathered wings, dark braided hair, and an ominous glare. As it landed along the side of the road, the being which the witness states came to earth within 75 feet of her, was 12 to 15 feet tall with a wingspan of 25 to 30 feet. When the participant first got a good look at the humanoid, it was still in the air. It appeared to have a long, tail-like appendage hanging down where its legs should be. However, by the time the being touched the earth, it developed two legs on which to stand. When the being landed, the witness describes his arms and legs somewhat awkwardly positioning themselves for a balance point as his wings acted like a giant sail in the powerful wind. The witness was very adamant that she was trying to find others who had witnessed this incredible landing. The incident occurred along a busy highway, and she recalls having at least one near-miss collision as both she and the other drivers around her were distracted. It seems evident from the witness's statements that other people saw the being, it certainly appears that it wanted to be seen. The witness notes that if it had chosen to set down a few fields over, it would have been invisible from the highway. Shifting over to rural Quebec in December of 2017, the witness and her boyfriend were visiting relatives over the Christmas holiday in St. Edgar. The couple was driving on Chemin Mercier and using the slippery roads caused by recent snowfall to drift. This activity seems to have been the definition of fun in that small town that night. The witness stated that the couple was approaching the end of the road when something flew through the trees to their right, just above where the headlights are lighting up. The thing is so large and heavy that the trees are touched and swinging all around. The creature had huge black wings that blotted out the already dark sky. The witness describes the size of the being as a moose with wings, minus the four legs, and the size of a car, but she also states that the creature was more tall than broad. The witness was unable to tell in the dark whether the being had arms or a face, and she did not see any eyes. The wingspan of the creature was 15 to 20 feet, and the wings were described as dark and feathery. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!